Hello and welcome to our lecture on chapter 6. And today we'll talk about a few different things, but we'll start with learning objective 1. And learning objective 1 says identify the characteristics, the location of, and the fluids produced by the four body membranes. And so the four membrane types are mucus, serous, cutaneous, and synovial. And so we'll talk about all of those now. Cutaneous membrane um, is the largest membrane of the body. It's the outermost protective boundary, and it's known as the skin. It is made up of stratified squamous epithelium, which is the epidermis, resting on a top layer of connective tissue called the dermis. Skin is exposed to the air, therefore it's a dry membrane, and it is considered an epithelial membrane. Mucosal membranes. There are two principal kinds of internal membranes, mucus and serous. When we talk about a mucous membrane or a mucosal membrane or a mucosa, we're talking about a membrane that lines the passages that are open to the exterior environment. Things like your digestive, respiratory, urinary, and reproductive tracts. A mucous membrane consists of two to three layers, sometimes two, sometimes three. An epithelium, an areolar connective tissue layer called the lamina propria, and often there is also a third layer of smooth muscle called the muscul muscularis mucosae. Moist membranes, uh, these are moist membranes that are covered in mucus secreted by what are called goblet cells and mucus glands, sometimes both. The mucus traps foreign particles, bacteria, viruses, supposed to keep the body safe. A serous membrane, or a serosa, lines open body cavities that are closed to the exterior. Uh, it's composed of simple squamous epithelium resting on a thin layer of areolar connective tissue, just like the previous membrane. The parietal layer lines specific portions of the wall of the ventral cavity. The visceral layer covers the outside of organs in that cavity. Serous layers separated by a thin layer of serous fluid, which is secreted by both membranes. Serous fluid allows organs to slide easily without friction, the heart sliding against the lungs. Serosa that lines the abdominal cavity is the peritoneum, and in the thorax, the serous membranes isolate the lungs and the heart from each other. Around the lungs is the pleura, and around the heart is the pericardium. The synovial membrane it secretes a lubricating fluid. Synovial membranes line fibrous capsules that surround your joints. They're composed of soft areolar connective tissue and they contain no epithelial cells. It provides a smooth surface and a lubricated environment so that your joints can move around. Synovial membranes line small sacs of connective tissue called bursas and it cushions organs during muscle activity. Okay. Learning objective two, identify the major functions of the integumentary system. The integumentary system consists of the skin, the hair, the nails, glands, and nerves. The main function of the integumentary system is to act as a barrier to protect the body from our outside environment, retain body fluids, which is preventing desiccation or drying out, protect against disease, eliminate waste products, and regulate body temperature. Some other things it does is vitamin D synthesis, sensation, and also nonverbal communication. Okay, third learning objective. Explain the composition of and the function of the two layers of the skin. And so I'll actually talk about three different layers here, but only two of them are part of the skin itself. The epidermis is the outermost layer of the skin, and it provides a waterproof barrier and creates our skin tone. The dermis lies beneath the epidermis, and it contains tough connective tissue, hair follicles, and sweat glands. And then the hypodermis is below that. And the hypodermis is made up of fat and connective tissue, and it is highly vascular. It serves as an energy reservoir and thermal insulation. And while the hypodermis is often studied with the skin, it is not considered to be actually part of the skin. Okay. Let's talk about the layers of the epidermis. 
The first is the stratum corneum, the very top layer. It's the outermost layer of the epidermis, and it is comprised of dead skin cells for protection. It's made up of 10 to 30 thin layers of continually shedding off dead, what are called keratinocytes, or completely keratinized cells. The outermost cells age and wear down, right? Just think about the top layer of your skin. And they get replaced by new layers of strong and long wearing cells. They get sloughed off continually as new cells will take its place. But this shedding process slows down as you age. Complete cell turnover occurs every 28 to 30 days in young adults. The same process will take about 45 to 50 days in elderly adults. So here's the stratum corneum right here with its very keratinized, rough cells. The next layer is the stratum spinosum. It's found between the stratum corneum and basale. It has a spiny appearance because it has these shrinking microfilaments between cell junctions called desmosomes. Keratinization begins in the stratum spinosum. Once keratinization is complete, cells will undergo apoptosis or programmed cell death. Keratin is a fibrous protein that is found in skin, hair, and nails. And keratin helps protect the body against pathogens by presenting them to the immune system. Stratum basale. Uh, the stratum basale is a single layer of cuboidal or low columnar cells sitting on a basement membrane. The cell types in this layer, there are keratinocytes. Keratinocytes undergo mitosis and help replace the cells in the epidermis. Most of the cells in the epidermis uh, get replaced this way. Um, it makes keratin that protective protein. The other cell type is the melanocytes. Melanocytes synthesize melanin. They distribute melanin uh, from cell processes. Melanin gets picked up by keratinocytes and it's used to shade their nuclei from UV radiation. Melanin, of course, is also what causes skin to have any tone from uh, completely dark black to lightly brown. The other are Merkel cells, often called tactile cells. Um, these serve as touch cells and they relay touch information like texture and pressure to the brain. And while they are present in human skin, they are at their highest density on the fingertips, the lips, and the face because that's where touch sensation is most acute. Okay. That was the epidermis. Talk a little bit more about the dermis here. The dermis is the lower inner layer of the two main layers of cells that make up the skin. It contains blood vessels, lymph vessels, hair follicles, and glands that produce sweat and something called sebum. Sweat and sebum reach the skin's surface through tiny openings in the skin that act as pores. And sebum is that oily substance that helps keep your skin from being dry and cracked. The hypodermis, again, not part of the skin, but often studied with it, is a subcutaneous tissue. It has more areolar and adipose tissue than the dermis has. It pads the body and it binds skin to the underlying tissues. It's a common site of drug injection because there are so many blood vessels. Subcutaneous fat is good for energy reservation, thermal insulation. It's often thicker in women than men and it is thinner in infants and the elderly. Okay, here's what that looks like. So the first uh, thing I wanna point out here is the melan melanocyte. Uh, the melanin granules will accumulate on the sunny side of the nucleus of keratinocytes. Melanin granules will protect the DNA uh, within the nucleus from being damaged by the UV radiation from the sun. Here is a Merkel cell, which is a touch receptor. And um, the keratinocytes up here, uh, they'll produce more and more keratin and undergo terminal differentiation, where they'll be called fully cornified keratinocytes that help form the outermost layer of the skin, the stratum corneum. And they are constantly shed off and replaced by new cells. Okay, the fourth learning objective is to distinguish between the derivatives of the epidermis, including hair, the hair follicle, the erector pili, sebaceous glands, nails, 
sudoriferous glands, apocrine, and ecrine glands. Let's talk about those. Okay, first I'd like to talk about exocrine glands in general. Exocrine glands are glands that produce and secrete substances onto the epithelial surface by way of a duct. Um, some things I'll talk about are the apocrine and ecrine sweat glands, salivary glands, mammary glands, lacrimal glands, sebaceous glands, and mucous glands. Okay, sudoriferous or sweat glands, you are perspiring all the time, but most of it, when you're not doing strenuous work, is totally uh, non-recognizable to you. You produce about 500 milliliters of insensible perspiration per day. It it's produced, but it evaporates as soon as it is. Now, when you start to do tough, hard work and you start to have visible wetness with sweating, that is called diaphoresis. Okay, that's when you're sweating and you can you look wet. That is called diaphoresis. Ecrine, or sometimes called marocrine glands, are the simple tubular glands, and there are three to four million in adults, and they help to just cool the body. They're dense on the palms, on the soles of your feet, and on the forehead, things where, uh, places where sweat is produced quite often is where they are, but they're all over the body. Apocrine glands produce sweat that contains fatty acids, um, and these are found only near like hair follicles and they respond to stress. Bromhydrosis is body odor produced by bacterial breakdown of those fatty acids. And it's no surprise that you'll find apocrine, apocrine sweat glands near the axillary, groin, anal, and areola regions. Things that sometimes get a little smelly if you don't take care of them. Okay, sebaceous glands. Uh, sebaceous glands uh, secrete an oil called sebum that contains just parts of broken down cells. Now, I told you before that sebum helps keep the hair and the skin from becoming dry, brittle, and cracked. And what's ironic is that we go to great lengths to take showers to wash the sebum off, only to want to replace it with lotions. And those lotions often contain something called lanolin, which is just sheep sebum. Um, so it's kind of interesting to think about. Uh, but these are flask-shaped glands that have ducts that open into the hair follicles. Okay, now the hair and the nails. Hair, nails, and cutaneous glands are accessory organs or appendages of the skin. Hair and nails are composed mostly of dead keratin keratinized cells. Just They have a lot of keratin. The uh, pliable and soft keratin makes up the stratum corneum of the skin, the outer layer of the skin. The compact hard keratin makes up the hair and the nails. It's tougher and more compact due to numerous cross linkages between keratin molecules. That's why the nails are so hard and your uh, hair is very pliable. Here's what a hair uh, follicle and a hair uh, uh, just under a scanning electron microscope, this is the hair shaft. You can see how that's broken down. And this is a keratinocyte. Okay, um, parts of the hair. If you ever see the word pilus or pili, um, that's just another name for hair. Uh, pili is just a plural, of, so many hairs. A hair is a slender filament of keratinized cells growing from a tube in the skin called a hair follicle. Hair covers most of the body. Um, places where hair does not cover include the palms, the soles, palmar and planter, and lateral surfaces and distal segments of fingers and toes, uh, lips, nipples, parts of genitals. Um, the limbs and the trunk have about 55 to 70 hairs per centimeter squared. The face has about 10 times as many. Right, you think about growing beards and mustaches and things like that. Um, there are about 100,000 hairs on an average person's scalp, um, but the differences that you'll see in hairiness across individuals is mainly due to differences in both the texture and the pigment of hair due to differences in genetics. Structure of the hair follicle. 
Hair is divisible into three zones along its length. The bulb, which is a swelling at the base where hair originates in the dermis or hypodermis. Um, the only living hair cells are in or near the bulb. The root, which is the remainder of the hair in the follicle, and the shaft, which is the portion above the skin surface that you actually see. Uh, the dermal papilla is a bud of the vascular connective tissue encased by the bulb. Only source of nutrition for the hair comes from the dermal papilla. The hair matrix is the region of mitotically active cells, meaning cells going through mitosis, and that's immediately above the papilla, and it's the hair's growth center. Right? That makes sense. That's where the nutrition is. That's where the cells are going to grow. If you looked at hair in a cross section, you would see three layers. The medulla, which is a core of loosely arranged cells and air spaces. The cortex, which, uh, the cortex, which constitutes the bulk of the hair, and it consists of several layers of elongated, keratinized cells. And the cuticle, which is composed of multiple layers of very thin, scaly cells that overlap each other. The free edges of the cuticle get directed upward. Okay, uh, more about the hair and the follicle. Follicle is a diagonal tube that extends into the dermis and sometimes the hypodermis. Um, the epithelial root sheath is an extension of the epidermis lying adjacent to a hair root. It widens at a deep end into the bulge and it's the source of stem cells for follicle growth. The connective tissue root sheath is derived from the dermis, but it's a little bit denser, and it surrounds the epithelial root sheath. Hair receptors are the sensory nerve fibers that entwine follicles, and the pilorector muscle, or the erector pili, uh, is a smooth muscle that attached to the follicle to, that attaches the follicle to the dermis. It contracts to make hair stand on end, giving you goosebumps. So that's near. That's what the erector pili does. And then if we look at nails as our last slide here, nails are just tightly packed, hard keratinized cell. Um, you can, uh, there's a few different things about the nails we'll talk about. The nail matrix, which is under the root of the nail. It's the site of nail growth. It transforms the normal skin cells into nail cells, which then push forward. Um, your nail growth uh, happens about one millimeter per week in the fingers, and it's slower in the toes. But the longer the finger, the greater the growth rate of the nail. And with that being said, we will call it there, and I'll see you in the next lecture.